cool. Hi everyone, my name is Martin. I'm part of FEDSA and this is uh, a FEDSA mentoring session, uh, which today we're going to be looking at JavaScript testing using Jest. Uh, we have our mentoring sessions every Monday between five and six. Uh, between five and six, you can join us. If you just come to the Zeta Tech Slack server um, and join the FEDSA mentoring channel, you'll find more details there. Uh, our sessions are sponsored by Code Capsules, which is I don't know if they enjoy, they like that I call it this, but to me, it's sort of the South African version of Netlify. Um, and like I highly encourage, and I'm not saying this just because they're sponsors, but deploying your websites there for a South African base, it's amazing. It is so fast. Like I've never seen a page load as fast as this. Um, and, and I love their services. Like um, every every chance every chance that I get, like I'm deploying on their services over Netlify just because of that speed, just to see something load within like 0. 0.000 seconds. Um, that that just really blows people's minds away when they see your page load that fast. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at yeah, and the website's codecapsules.io. Um, so today we're going to be looking at JavaScript testing. Let me just go and get my screen shared. Okay, so you should all be able to see that. Yeah, so um, can I just get one of you to confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Cool. All right. Okay, everybody. So this is Jest. Um, what what is Jest? It's it's a testing library or, or framework that basically lets you um, write uh, code that tests your code to make sure that it, it does the things that you want it to do. Um, one of the coolest things about it is it's, it's zero config. As, as they say, so that means you just add it to your library, or sorry, add it to your project, and that's it, ready to go. Um, there's also some cooler things where it's like snapshot testing. We'll get to that in a moment, but that's almost like if you've got like a website, it will go and look at all these colors, like for example, these red buttons over here. And then if someone were to change these buttons to blue, it's gonna, it's gonna immediately know that it doesn't match that original snapshot, which is like a picture of your page. And it's gonna immediately go and say to you, hey, someone went and changed this. Um, so it's great for that. Right, so before we even actually look at, at the library, I just wanted to load the website up here in case you wanted to load it. Um, let me go and drop the link very quickly for you, just in case you wanna have a look yourself. Um, so that, this is just how the website looks, so you know exactly how it's supposed to look. Okay, so, you know, why, why are we writing tests and, you know, what, what are tests, okay? So let's, let's just look at a basic, very basic example here. Um, so just imagine that that we're all working at the, a bank called Bank Africa. And this bank, they've got a function which is called add numbers, okay? And it is super basic. It just takes two values in. Um, and what it does is returns value one plus value two, okay? Um, so let's just console add numbers. Oh, sorry, do you mind just blowing that up a little bit? Yeah, me? sorry. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, not, not all of us have uh, 4K monitors. <laughs> <Martin>. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I'm, I love the 4K, especially for like screen sharing, because now it's it's not so disorientating. Okay, so let's let's just say we've got this function here. Um, and I just want to run this. Have I got Nodemon running here? I don't think so. Oh, I do. Okay. So at the bottom here, I've got Nodemon running, which is um, Node runs your JavaScript files. Like we have covered this, but let's just go over it again. Um, if you run Node, you can actually run your JavaScript files. Uh, but then you've got Nodemon, which is a watcher. So it will see if there's any changes, and then it basically runs your Node command again and again and again, anytime you make a change. Um, so this is just so that you can see at the bottom here, yes, our values here. Um, and I'll just go and actually add results here. So it's a bit easy to see this. Okay. Right, so we've got this function now that adds two numbers. Um, and it's a, you put a, a, a parameter in, or your argument, which is one value in the other, and it puts them together and it just returns it, right? It's super, super straightforward. There's no complexity, like nothing to sort of, don't overthink this. It's just a function that just adds two numbers, right? So now at, the, at our bank, we're using this to add every single transaction that, that could possibly be. So you go and you buy something to pick and pay, and then it gets added with your balance or whatever, and then th there's your total balance, right? So this is great and everything works. But then then they employ someone like me and I come along and I need this function to do something else for myself. So what I do is instead of going and adding the numbers, I minus the numbers, right? And now instead of my result being 30, which is what it was when we had 10 and 20, we've actually now got a result of minus 10. Now that's that's problematic. Like I know I know this this sounds like a silly example at a bank. You've got this 
this function that adds two numbers or whatever. But just imagine that there was a function like this, right? Everything would come crashing down. Like everything would break. And you might not even know what the problem was. Like, I mean, what is the difference here? It's, it's one operand, sorry, one operator that's changed it. Um, so this is, this is really problematic. Um, and eventually people thought about like, how can we actually fix this type of thing? Um, so if we look at our function, we can manually sort of run our minds through this. So let's just say that I'm thinking, now, okay, I want to test that this function works. Let's just put it back to a plus here. So if I pass in 10 and I pass in another value 10, in my mind, I know that this function is actually going to have a result of 20. And then not only that, I can actually console log running this function. So let's, sorry, let me just make it 10 here. So if I console log this function, I know exactly what it's doing. I can see that I'm adding 10 and I'm adding 10 and I'm getting a result of 20, right? So I am actually testing my function here to see that it works. But that's, that's, that's not really useful for us because we need a way to basically do this, but in a way that it reports back to us to say, okay, it is actually doing this or, hey, wait a minute, this is not actually doing this. Um, so I know I'm, for people, for those of you that do know testing, I might seem like I'm rambling on a little bit about this, but it's with the students that I currently teach at the moment, um, they seem to struggle with the reason, the understanding of why, why are we doing this and, and basically how functions, I'm sorry, how tests work. Um, so, so right now we can basically run our own test by saying that if we add these parameters in here, we know what the result should be. Okay. That's, that's the basic principle is that. We know what we're passing into our test. We know what should be returned out of our test. So we know if we pass 10 plus 10, we know that we're supposed to be getting 20 because it's 10 plus 10. Okay. So that's that's sort of the basic principle of our test. Um, so now let's actually go and start bringing Jest into the story, which is now our testing framework. Okay. So I just want to just um, make sure that I'm exporting my function here. Okay. So done something wrong well, let me not even get to that yet okay so the way that we start uh writing our tests is we've got two ways to do it the one method of writing your tests um when you're using jest is that you have a folder where you go and you put two underscores the word test and then two more underscores now what you do in yeah is you try and copy the same file structure that you had so if i had a shopping cart like i do yeah and i want to test something inside you then inside my test folder i would have shopping cart and then i put my test inside so for example let's say i've got the shopping cart.js i'm going to have my test folder there's going to be a shopping cart of shopping cart folder and then inside that there's going to be sorry there must be a file that's going to be shopping cart.js and now that's going to be my test file okay now this is the one way of doing it the other way is called co-location, and that means to basically take uh, all of your files, and it's not just testing, all of your files um, that are related to one aspect and then keeping it in one folder. So, for example, if we had um, an HTML file for shopping cart, it would also be inside you. And if we had um, a style sheet for shopping cart, it would also be inside you. So the way that that works um, with testing and co-location is that in your shopping cart, you would have shopping cart, and then you put dot and then test dot js okay so the reason why we're doing this is so that jest is going to go and look through your whole file structure um, and it's either going to look for that test folder that we previously had or it's going to go and try and find a file that's got the, the word test written in it like this okay um any questions while i set this up uh, any, so any preference oh, go ahead for me, um, I've been working through um, Ken C. Dodds' um, Epic Rack course, and he makes a very strong argument for co-location. And just because of the way that I work, like when I use style components, I've got my component file. For example, I've got the shopping cart.js. Then I've got a style sheet, and I've got a test file. It just makes sense to me to have co-location going. Um, so th that is my personal preference, but that doesn't mean it's right. It's just it's, it's an opinionated thing, which means... Um, no way is correct as long as it's working for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I. I. Same here. I. I actually, to be honest, I co-locate my documentation as well. Mm. Uh, so I usually have a README file in that folder as well. 
yeah, like I'm I'm very much on the co-location train. Yeah. Um, Martin, how do you feel about the double underscores? Uh, so as far as I understand, that is uh, just a convention for jest, correct? Or is, is that a, a broader pattern? I thought that it was possibly a broader pattern. Like I've only really worked with jest mostly and then Jasmine when I was learning. Um, and mm -hmm. I think Jasmine had the same thing with the underscore mm -hmm. underscore test. So I presume that it was like a test related um, convention that gets followed. Uh, but I'm mm -hmm. not actually certain if um, Jasmine follows the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've actually stopped doing that um, because uh, I'm not using jest that much nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I mostly like uh, do visual regressive testing and so forth. Uh, but yeah, I stopped actually doing that. And I found that it makes my code a lot harder to read um, those underscores, mm -hmm. um, especially yeah. when I'm looking at the file explorer. Yeah, no, personally, I don't, I don't ever use what what I don't like. Um, but, but isn't really the underscores that are a problem with me. What I don't like about using the underscore system. Um, is that you need to go and replicate your folder structure. So mm. if I decide to move my component somewhere else, I now need to go and move my tests somewhere else. Um, mm. And that to me is just super redundant. I like I don't I don't like anything that kills workflow needs needs to go. Like workflow is mm. the most important thing to me um, when it comes to coding. Mm. Cool, that makes sense. Okay, so let's get back to um, exporting this file. Uh, Okay, so we were going to go and create a test file here. So we've got an index.js file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an index.test.js file, right? Okay, and so now here is our test. Um, let me just look at my notes. I want to make sure that I do follow a basic structure that I've got here. Yes, okay. So here is a test file. And as, as you know, we, we need to have the two underscores and then we need to have our, or, or dot .test convention. Um, so now before we actually get to actually writing the test, I just want to show um, just two sort of ways to neatly structure your code. Um, and it's a describe block and uh, basically your test block, okay? There's a way that you can scope your test. So, so imagine we had, we had a whole bunch of tests. So we had like um, tests that, that uh, how do I write this? Um, test it adds. So imagine we had that, this this banking system over here where we're adding numbers now we also add one that subtracted numbers so let's actually just do this we just say subtract numbers um we make it one minus so in our tests we could have our tests where we're adding the numbers then we're also going to actually write a bunch of tests where it subtracts our numbers right so we'd have a whole bunch of tests related to this first function and then a whole bunch of tests related to the section second function but if you were to just write your tests in a single line, single line, single line, it becomes messy very quickly. So there's a way you can just organize your tests. Um, and I just wanted to cover this first. It just seems seems to make the most sense to do it that way. So the first thing you do is you get a describe block, right? Um, I've actually got an image that just automatically completes it for me. I used to have an image that used to just auto complete it for me. Um, there it is there. Okay. S super, super simple syntax. Uh, you basically just got to describe and then what is going to be written in your test when you run it and then you put your code inside here okay so this is the describe block and you can use this now to separate your test so for example over here this would be for our add numbers um technically you should actually be splitting these into their own test files but just for the example here um we could use this for our add numbers tests and then our second describe block can be for the subtract numbers so that when you run your tests you're going to know exactly that those tests belong to add numbers and then the other ones belong to subtract numbers. Okay, so we've got our describe blocks going and this this is just like labels. It's not actually doing any code. Um, sorry, just give me a moment. So now inside you, what we actually do is now we write our tests, okay? Now there's two ways you can write your test. Or it's just like, it's more like um, syntactic sugar, which just means it's just the way that you prefer to actually write it. And the first is, um test okay and we follow the exact same syntax like this where we've got our description so this is a test and then we've got our anonymous function that goes like that okay um so the one way to do it is test right um but you're supposed to read this starting with this word so you will say something like test it adds numbers okay um 
Then there is another way, and it's the way that I prefer, but that does not mean it's correct. It's just the way I prefer. Is that instead of writing test, you could write it. Um, so the same thing. Uh, it's numbers, anonymous function. Okay. So exact same thing. It's just a matter of how you actually want to read it. Okay. So you could say test, it adds numbers, but then, you know, this becomes a bit long. Now, every time you're writing it there. So what you could instead then is use it. And now you read it like a sentence. It adds numbers. Right. So um, very cool. So let's now actually go and actually write our very first test. Uh, when you are writing your test, you have to have one test unit going. Otherwise, it's going to fail. So let's actually just go and um, try run this. And you're going to see that it's actually not going to run. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, at, at the end, I'll share the link. Um, I'll actually just share it in, in the mentoring channel, but I've got I've got notes here that I've made for everybody just so that if you want to know how to actually install Jest um, to a basic project and you know how to set it up so that you can put it in a watch mode and everything. So all the details are there for you to get it up and running and it's it's very quick. It takes, takes less than five minutes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to run um, some commands or some scripts that we've got here. And it's going to basically be npm run test watch, which is going to just keep watching for our tests. Okay, so you can see now it's immediately, um, let me close this so you can see it a bit better. Okay, so this is now your test that it's actually running. Um, I'm actually going to take this out so we can see it break. Okay, so now I don't actually have any anything inside my test file. When I run jest, it's looked, it's gone through all of my files that it's allowed to look into. And it's tried to find anything that's got a test. Or alternatively that underscore directory um, and then it finds a file and then it tries to run the tests in the file but you can see here it says yeah your test suite must contain at least one test so that that's why i started writing the stuff in first um, so we actually do have to have one test case basically um, okay so this itcher is i think what you could actually technically call your actual test and then inside it is where we actually do our assertions where we actually see what is actually happening Okay, so let's let's have a look at the basic syntax of this. Um, and then this is now where all the magic is going to come. Okay, so what you first write is expect. Okay, then you've got something that's going to go in here. And then afterwards, you've got a matcher. Okay, so the syntax is going to be expect. Something that goes in here, something. And then a matcher. Okay, so what it's actually going to happen here is that we're going to expect, for example, um, that function we had previously, uh, I'm going to have to bring it back down, sorry. It was just add numbers, right? Okay. So, for example, when I said to you earlier that we actually had uh, the add numbers function, we are going to go and call this function adds numbers with parameters that we are wanting to know exactly what they're going to do. So I want to test that 10 plus, 20, 10, plus 10 is going to equal 20. So I'm going to say 10 for my first parameter, second for my pr um, second parameter, 10 for my second parameter, sorry. And then over here is now your matcher. Now, with the matches, there are tons and tons of matches. Let me actually, it's probably better I'll just do it like this. Um, and matches are where you can test what that value is going to be. So we could actually go and test um, what the actual value is. We can test, is it of a type string? We can test if it's not a string. We can test, you know, truthiness. There's a whole... There's just so much stuff you can test. You can even eventually start testing the DOM. And in React, you can even test your elements. Um, or your, sorry, your components. So over here, what we're going to use is um, the most basic matcher that you get, which is to be, right? And to be is just going to, it's just like, does it equal this? Okay. So we're going to say, does add numbers to be, well, sorry, we expect add numbers and the result, the return from add numbers 10 and 10 to be 20 okay so it's almost like in our mind when we ran through this function we went and we said add numbers 10 plus 10 we know we're going to get 20 right because it's just basic math we're doing the exact same thing in our jest test here we're calling this function with these two parameters and we know we just we just automatically know like it's it's just known that it's going to be 20 okay and that is that's that's the basics of the of this test and if, if you actually understand what i'm saying here then immediately you you won most of the battle yeah um this is what people tend to struggle with like what are we actually passing in here and what are we actually trying to do so what we're doing is that we're calling our function and we're saying we expect this function with these values we expect it to return 
that value there. Okay, so let's save that. Um, so now I need to just get my function in here. So just give me a moment. So I don't have my basic, you know, so I'm just actually going to do it like that. I always, always struck, struck, struggle with imports and exports when having default projects like this. So add numbers. Okay. Right, I'm glad that didn't go belly up. Right, so here we go. We've actually got our test, right? Okay, so at the top, we've got our describe block. And you can see it here when it runs its test. It's got this sort of, it's like a label. And all your tests are actually going to go in here. So let me, let me actually just go and duplicate this like five times. Um, actually, that's not even going to work. I'm going to have to do it like this. So I just want to just clean up the, the test here so that it makes more sense in the terminal. So I'm going to say it adds... 10 and 10 then returns 20 um, and then I'll just go and just duplicate that and I'll just double up the values and then returns 40. Okay. Hey Jane. Okay. So now you can see that the, with the labels now, it's going to be a lot clearer. So we've got our describe block, right? So this is now, our tests are actually scoped to this describe block. They're inside this describe block, right? So they're contained in that box. So here is here is our describe block. And then inside here, you can see there's the first test and then there's the second test. So can you see how it's like getting super, super neat? So we can maybe say function adds numbers. Um, and, and that's just super neat. So if you actually had like 50 different describe blocks and all of that, it would all just be, it would look really neat when your tests are running and you'd know immediately where it fails. So let's just actually get this one to failure. Um, so you can see here, yeah, it's actually a test that's failed. When I try to add the numbers 20 and 20, um, I added 20 and 20 and usually we'd expect it to be 40, right? But I actually said that this function is actually going to, is meant to be returning 410, which is just not correct at all. And so therefore the test is actually failing. Um, but I'm going I'm to get to failing in a moment. It's not what I wanted to discuss yet. Okay, so so this is the describe block, and then inside you, we're actually running tests. Um, to very quickly disable a test, what you can do is you can actually put an X in front of um, the it, or the, the test, and you save it, and you're going to see it's actually skipped that test. Um, so let's, I'm actually just going to duplicate it so we've got a lot of them, even though it's the same test that's running. Uh, you can see that it's actually gone and skipped this test. That saves a lot of time. Instead of going and having to comment this out, so that it doesn't run. you rather do it like this. And then, you know, you've got an indication that you can come back and actually go and redo this test. Um, then there's another really cool one, which is ONI. Uh, and it will only run that one test. So, like, I didn't even know about this when I first started. So what I had to do, if I only wanted to run one test, I'd have to disable that, and I'd disable this one, I'd disable the other one, and I had to undo all of it. Um, where what you can actually do is you can just say ONI. Now, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Yeah, I'm going to get that wrong. Let me just look at my notes quickly. Sorry. So it's it.only, right? Yes. Okay, great. So if you do a dot .only, like don't ever forget this one. This is just like the most amazing thing. Uh, when you put dot .only, it's only going to run that particular test. This is going to save you so much time. Because usually when you are using, when you're doing like test-driven development, which we will touch on in a moment, um, you usually only want to get one test to pass, or it's usually only one test that you're fighting with. So instead of having to go and uncomment or comment out all of your code and then, you know, do all of that, like revert all of that, uh, you can just do dot .only. So pity that X goes in the front and then this is dot .only, um, but that's, it, it is what it is. Okay, so we got that. Right, so now let's start actually talking about some matches, okay? Now that's, actually before, let me just see if there's any questions. Anybody got any questions yet? No test, no questions. Uh, I, yeah. I, I might have one. Yes, uh, I yes. might be preempting some stuff. Mm. Uh, do you uh, test uh, negative flow? Do you test errors? Um, and if so, um, how do you do it? So, for example, uh, let's say add number, uh, like we'll throw an error if you um, provide it with a string. Let's say you want to add numbers, hello, and world. 
Um, so do you kind of test error states as well, or do you only test success states? Um, I don't, I'm going to give you my response, but I, I should just go and, and preface it with that. I can't really speak as, as a huge authoritative figure on the right way to be writing tests and test driven development. Um, I've, I've tried to get involved in a lot of test driven development projects and just, just, just haven't found that exposure that I wanted to. So I've only been involved in a couple of, of TDD projects. Um, sorry, let me, let me just mention to everyone. So test driven development is where you actually write your test first and then you code it so that it passes your test. Um, so, so with all that being said, I, I, I don't add error testing to everything, but I do to really important functions. I find that if you go and you, and you try and test with errors and every single thing, you start over engineering your functions. Like for example, you're going to this add numbers. Um, you can go and do your error testing to make sure that it's always going to be a number that's passed. But then are you going to go and make sure that your numbers are always going to be um, smaller than 6 million digits so you don't overflow? Uh, and then, then in, I find that for a ba very basic function like this, you end up with a very complex function just purely for error checking in cases where you never are going to actually have a string passed in. So... Even though this function is so robust, there's never ever going to be a case that a string gets passed in. So should you have really gone and added all of that complexity? So so I'm not actually too sure. Skog, maybe you might even have a better answer to that than what I do. Um, phew, yeah, like I, I guess it also depends. Like I, I think what you mentioned about, you know, like over-engineering your tests. Um, I do find that uh, that's something that I do see quite a bit. I also find that I sometimes see other people do that where they they just write way too many tests and 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 the amount of time they could have been uh, writing tests uh, like they could have actually written code um, so like it's always tricky for me um, like when when do you test and why do you test you know like 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 true like true TTD believers would say you test everything um, I don't know like I I definitely, I've definitely seen where projects are over-tested, um, which causes two things. Um, it just causes um, you to spend resources writing tests for things that might like just be scrapped or replaced. And the other thing is as well, I've seen where the build process is just like takes an hour <laughs> just because it needs to run, or the deploy process just takes hours just because there's so many tests that need to run. Um, yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I tend to actually test negative flow quite a bit. Um, and in terms of how I do that, like the reason being because um, I, I, first and foremost, I subscribe to something called offensive programming, which is kind of like a, like a response to overly defensive programming. Um, so I try and have things throw errors as soon as possible. Um, I, I just find that um, it's a lot harder pushing errors to production um, if the entire thing breaks. Um, so, but um, yeah, so I, I tend to write more error tests. Um, and also when I do tend to write unit tests, it is usually for something that's pretty critical. So um, yeah, then I'm generally covering errors. Um, I often find that I have a much bigger problem just like trying to test too many variations. Mm. Um, and I actually don't know what the answer is to that. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. hopefully someone or you, yourself might provide me with some guidance on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to be one of our projects coming up is going to be big into to, into. Um, test-driven development, uh, and I've got, got a couple couple of people that I'm speaking to who are going to help shape it, um, and hopefully they can actually give us the correct answer to that. Like I think that the people that do test-driven development are probably the people that are going to know um, sort of the most about best cases when it comes to writing tests. Okay, so uh, let's let's head on to to matches here. Okay, so. As we, we discussed in the test, you've got your describe block, then you've actually got your test block, um, and then our actual um, assertion, which is basically we're saying we've, we are running this function, or whatever's inside here, um, and we expect it to be this over here. Now, usually you've just got to be, right? There's, 
there are, as I showed you over here, there is actually a ton of stuff. Um, so let me let me just go through uh, my notes here. Like I've got a lot of lot of different things. Um, you get to be, then you also get to, to equal, and it is that I think in to equal, um, it does. Oh yeah, we actually got it here. Um, so to be actually goes and tests the exact equality, but then when you've actually got an object, um, you have to use to equal so that it matches the two the two um, objects. Uh, then you've got things like numbers. You can actually go and test, is it actually greater than? So we can actually say, are those numbers to be, we can actually go and say dot, um, oh, we should go away, go away. Uh, it can be to be greater, I think, to be greater. Yeah, to be greater than, um, you get to less than. And, and then there's actually a really, really cool one, uh, which is an important one. And I actually never used to actually use it, but now like I, I, I know I should have. Um, you get... A really cool one, which is called, I think it's called, I've got it written here somewhere, um, to be close to. So if you know JavaScript or you, you've heard people joke about why JavaScript is bad, if you've got these two values, yeah, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, and you put them together, right, the answer should be 0 0.3, right? Because 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 should be 0 0.3. But because of um, the way the programming works and overflows and all of that, what you end up having is... When I try and do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, we expected 0 0.3. That's what we expected over here. But what we received was actually 0 0.30000, many zeros, four. Okay. That's a problem in JavaScript. And JavaScript's not the only language. Like, I, from my understanding, I mean, I don't know computer science that well when it comes to the overflow and all of that. Um, I believe that this isn't just a JavaScript thing. This is actually the way that the standards work around the numbers that I, E, E, whatever it is. Um, so for this, how do we handle this? You know, this failing in our test is a big problem. Um, so to fix this actually wouldn't really be in your test. It's actually your function. That's actually a problem here. Um, you actually, there's ways that you would sort of handle this. Like you can do, there's a couple of ways you can handle it so that you don't run into errors like this. But in regards to our test, what we could have actually done is said to be close to 0 0.3, save it. And there we go. We're actually passing our test because it's so close to what we need it to be. Okay, so that that's it's a very very sharp one. Try and try and remember this one. Um, score you lots of brownie points in your interviews and that. Uh, then you get to match. Uh, if you know JavaScript and regex or regular expressions, it's basically, well, what is the definition of that? It's it's sort of like a a way to check for patterns in strings. Um, so what you could do if we actually had a string here. So let's actually just imagine that there was actually a string function here. Uh, check string. I actually just add that anyways. Sorry, running out of real estate here. Check string. Sorry for the delay. Okay. So if we actually add this function here, check string, and we were to pass in a bunch of values to it, uh, my string, we could go and do a reject check with it. So we could say dot uh, to match. And then you would do your typical reject syntax would be something like, sorry, is it like that? Um, just string. I think I've got it all around. Yeah. Okay. So it would then go and do a reject check to, to match that. Okay. So it's super powerful. You've got sort of all of the JavaScript types and all of that. Um, then you can start Oh, you could do dot uh, to contain. So if we had an array over here, uh, so let's just say if our array was something like one, five, just a whole bunch of numbers, we could go and check that it contains, to contain, um, and then we could make sure that it contained a specific element that we wanted, for example, 21. Okay, that's this is a really, really important one. So if, for example, you're adding a bunch of products, you could check that your one product is, is actually inside there. Um, and I, I know it's a bit boring for me going through these matches, but I just, just so that you are aware that these things do exist. Like a lot of times when I'm learning, I wish a person just said, oh, by the way, did you know you can do that? Um, so yeah, these are the sort of like my prime pick that I got out of them. Okay, so that's that. Uh, one last one is that um, you also can check for truthies and falsies. So you can check that they're actually, um, you can check if it's undefined, you can check if it's null. Uh, so if you pass the wrong value in, like, like Skok was saying that, you know, you're going to be doing negative flow checking, you can go and check that. Um, 
if you don't pass anything, usually what happens when a function fails, it might just pass null back to you. Um, it's not going to throw an error, it's just going to pass back null. So what you could do is if you pass the wrong values, and you could check that it actually passes back null. Um, okay, so that's that's the basics when it comes to the um, these matches. So I've got an issue with, with my Linux ever since I got this 4K screen. I can't actually resize my windows, um, which really, really sucks. So I'm just going to try and be clever here and resize it on the other side. No, no. Oh, I can do it. There we go. Cool. Sorry, it's like the weirdest bug. Um, so now we can actually see a bit more. So these these are the matches that we did with all our bunch of tests. Now there's what I'm going to look at next is one of the coolest features, and I love it. It saves saves me every time. Um, we're going to be looking at setting up. Basically, this is called I think the setup and and the teardown. Um, so what what that means is when we were running our tests right, imagine we had a database. Um, and when you run tests, you actually you actually create an actual test database and you actually populate that with data and then you actually test that data. So let, let's actually use that as an example because I've done it a few times in MongoDB. Um, we would actually go and create a test database. But now with that test bot database, we'd actually need to populate it with data. Okay. So what you could actually do is you've got these before and after um, functions that you could make use of or methods uh, that lets us do things before our test runs and then do things after our test runs. So often with a database, you might need to log off or you might need to log your, your person out. Um, otherwise, there might be code issues or whatever. So so there'd also be your, your sort of teardown at the end. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is before each. Okay, so it's going to be the same sort of syntax as this. Uh, we just got that... I think it's the anonymous function. I think that's how it goes. Yeah. Um, so before each, well, basically any code that you've actually got here. So let's actually just go and write um, console log and say I am before each. Um, and then just save our test. She want to move this to the right. Let's get this on the screen. Okay. Um, so you can see uh, I've actually gone so logged and it's actually said um, I am before each. So if we were to actually go and do this like four times, you're going to see I am before each, I am before each, I am before each, I am before each. So you can see that these, each time the test is running, before each, it's going to run this code here. So if we actually had a database, um, we could make sure that it gets populated and something happens like you log your person in, you log, you, you authorize your person so that you can actually perform certain things like removing to-dos from a to-do list, okay? So you've got before each, but then you've also got before all, okay? Um, this is actually the one that you would actually be using in the case of a database because you don't actually want to be populating every single test. You're just going to populate before all of your tests run. So yeah, we're going to do console log um, before all. So I'll save that. And there you can see it's actually running once before everything actually runs. Um, yes, so now let's actually go and look at after each, which is just, it's sort of the inverse or the opposite of these. I'm just actually going to cheat here and I'm just going to just duplicate that. And Okay, so now we've actually got, after each of our functions, we've actually, after our tests have run, we've actually got these after eaches that are actually running. So you've got your before each that, that runs before your test starts. Your, then your test is actually running. And then after your test runs, it's got this teardown. Um, and it's usually just because like your test database and that sometimes, you know, you have to you have to log your your, your actual user out. Otherwise, it's, it's going to have problems um, for the next test that runs. Okay. So that's just the basic for after each and after all. Um, I'm sorry I don't have an example for this. Like I actually wish I actually set up a MongoDB database just to test. But when I add that complexity into these... Uh, mentor sessions and things tend to go wrong. Uh, just before I go to the next step, anybody else uh, curious? Questions? Anything of the sort? No. Okay. I, I can maybe add to that. So yes. I also what I find really helpful for um, setting up and tearing down is overriding the, um, the native uh, date uh, object in JavaScript. Um, because if you have tests where, for example, you're adding an item uh, to something and, you're, and, and as part of that is the date when it was added, 
obviously every time you run that test like it's gonna like the data is gonna be different mm. um so you can't test whether that date actually worked so what I, I tend to do quite a bit when i'm setting up is i actually just you can just override the actual uh, new date like object constructor mm. and just have it return like a static like predefined date always yeah no thanks man um okay so a couple more things martin can yes. i ask a quick question yeah um if you're writing a whole bunch of tests for each one is it not better to put it in a loop or something like that or must it rather be done individually so this is probably going to come down to preference um like are you for example asking if we're adding numbers like this and it's just doing the same thing so let's just say this one was dot four and this was dot five do you mean have all of these in one thing like this yeah almost like in a loop but even those to be closed and all those methods can't you maybe put that in a loop or is that going to be like almost have an array and then it matches against the array sort of thing or is that going to be too complicated too quickly no you can't you can do that um look for basic tests like this i think you're going to be causing problems for yourself because there's not actually going to be this static hard line of code for you to go and quickly go and know that this is actually what's failing in your code but there, no you are you can you can go and loop through through your tests or, or loop through content like you're saying and then generate your assertions from the content that's coming out you you can run into problems like I think there can be async issues that you can run into with the way that Jess runs its tests. Like with asynchronous code, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit challenging sometimes. Um, so you can do that, but then just know that it's a lot harder to modify your tests because now for me to understand that I'm testing this, like for example, in your case, you'd be talking about. Okay, let's just actually just do this very quickly. So you're talking about something like that, um, like this. I is this net R plus plus, and then you're gonna have an array. Um, up here that's just going to be const array as equal to and then it's just a bunch of values like this um mm -hmm. so for me to now know that you'd actually have to have two you'd have to have your questions and you'd also have to have answers so for me to quickly look at this i actually have to pass this in my brain i have to go and substitute that value out because this is going to be something like array r um and then i have to try and figure it out so it becomes harder to maintain um and i think with tests you're trying to make these things as simple as possible so in basic cases like this, I don't think you should. Um, and that's just my personal opinion. It could be completely wrong. It's, and, uh, but you will have cases where you do have to loop through it and then do your assertions. So you, you, you can, you can. Um, but try and keep it as simple as possible. You don't want your tests to be like, you don't want your tests to break easily. Um, and you want them to be maintainable. Is there a maximum amount that you test on a function or is that now depending on what you're testing and the function that you're testing on so there actually is something called coverage which was going to be the next topic but let's actually look at it now um let's just take this out so when it comes to test there is there is a way for it uh for you to sort of see how much you've actually tested in your actual function so let's actually run this test here like i actually set this up in the instructions for you for you all so that you can actually just go in here and just flip this this to true if you want to just sort of see how it actually works so now when i save it um actually i think i'm gonna have to re restart it okay so now when this test actually runs it's actually telling you how much of your code has actually been tested and um are there, are there lines of code that are actually not tested in your function? Uh, so I know this isn't exactly what you're asking, but I thought it was going to lead to this. So this actually says to me, look, in, far, in lines 5 to 8 in my function, um, over here, 5 to 8, which is our other things, we haven't actually tested this as part of this file. So it's saying to us, look, go and write these tests. Um, and if we were to write tests like that, we'd probably get close to 100% coverage. But uh, with that being said, this is one of those touchy subjects where some people try to aim for 100 percent coverage where a lot of people will say it doesn't really matter as long as you're actually testing what's important um but no so there isn't a limit though you can write as many tests as you want but remember that you have to maintain your tests you're still spending your time coding um mm. you know like it's so it's, it's like comments you know when you're commenting your code 
you need to comment in a meaningful way. And the same with the test, you need to test in a meaningful way that these tests are really mattering. Like for me to go and write a thousand tests where it's five plus five is equal to 10, six plus six is equal to 12, seven plus seven is equal to 14. I don't think you're achieving many after you've written two or three, you know, is, is there any point in testing every single number combination in the whole world? You know, th th there's no point in doing it. You sort of want to test just your sort of main base case where you add your numbers, we expect one plus one to equal two. Then where you really want to be testing is testing your edge cases. And that's the stuff that's going to break. You know, if a person passed in uh, like that, that was actually an edge case that we actually had earlier. The 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is equal to 0 0.3. Like you would want to test these edge cases. Um, yeah. Sorry, does, does that actually answer your question or is, is there a bit more? Okay. Yeah, that does sort of answer it. Okay, Thanks. Cool. Um, so running a bit strapped in time. So I just want to just very quickly discuss about uh, test-driven development. Um, so the way that that basically works, it's actually really, really cool. It's a pity that a lot of people just don't work. Like I've, I struggle people don't, don't really want to work with test-driven development. So the way that this would work is that you would actually very, you'd first actually go and write your test, okay? Um, let me go and just create a new test file here, um, example.test.chess. So let's just say we were going to actually go and create um, like a baking cake type of test. Okay, so it should bake a cake. Actually, no, that's not going to actually be a very good example. So it should give me a total of a cart. So imagine that we were going to go make a shopping cart, right? Um, so the way it would work is that we would actually write the tests first. So there'd be something like, we would actually just have our very empty function. We have to just make an example or test, sorry, example or JS for you. And in, in this file here, we would just sort of write just the function name so that we can call it. Then inside here, we would actually start saying, okay, it should actually give me a total of the cart. So if I was to do, let's say this, this actually get ex got exported as, um, cart dot you know, just cart and there would be a method like uh, get total and add items so that when we would actually import our cart here we'd import the cart but i'm actually just going to go and just actually um just going to make it do nothing so what we would actually do is we would actually start writing our test already we'd say something like expect cart dot add or get total To be zero because our cart would be empty right um then we would actually go and expect cart dot add item actually we'd first we'd first go and add add an item so cart add item um and we just do something like rd zero price 99.99 then we would expect item dot get total sorry cart dot get total to be 99 .99. Okay, so we've got these test cases now, but it's going to fail. Um, so it should fail now. There, okay, so it fails. So now what we would do now is we would actually start coding this cart. We'd actually say, okay, so const cart is equal to this. And then inside here, we'd have something like a get total. Um, and then this would return, let's just say there was items here, const items. This is an array. Sorry. And then to get the total, we return items dot reduce. So I'm just going to very quickly just get this reduce right. Um, so it's an example for the video. So over here, this would basically go and we just say total is plus equal to item dot price and then we return total. Okay, so what this would do is it's going to reduce all of our items in an array. Here. Um, so this isn't like actual proper syntax but it's the point will come across so it will actually go and get the total so then when we actually ran this function the test would actually start passing and then you would do another one until your test actually started passing so you're basically actually writing your tests first and then getting your code to pass the test now when you code this way you end up with code that is incredibly clean and incredibly modular because otherwise if you actually write yourself a complex product, uh, sorry, project, and then you go and you start trying to write tests afterwards, you'll see 
you struggle. You struggle big time because a little bit of code that you wrote there can't be extracted out and it's stuck there and you can't test it on its own. So you actually can't even write a test for it. Um, and you end up painting the solves into corners. So into a corner. So by doing test-driven development, it basically keeps you, it, it makes you write very modular reusable code. Um, and it's, and I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's a sort of coding paradigm that you need to be following. It's just another way of coding. Um, and for some people, it's incredibly important. Uh, it's, it's, I haven't found a lot of exposure to actually being able to work with it. So I've only worked on a couple of projects um, and they weren't that big. Uh, but I know I know there are some companies, uh, a couple floating around South Africa where they only do test driven development and, and those they all swear by it. Okay, so we're going to be running out of time now. Uh, so I guess I'm going to just take any, any final questions and then after that's done, as typical fashion, we'll probably just also hang around for a couple of minutes um, off camera just to discuss any any programming questions that you may have. So just anything related to this session, anything related to testing, any questions? No. Okay, so that's just been like a basic sort of look at Jest. Uh, it's only sort of like an introduction. We've got I've got a much bigger testing unit sort of coming up for everyone where we're actually doing React testing using React testing library. Um, and there you're going to see it's going to get nice and complex. And you actually are going to be looping. Uh, like Douglas asked earlier, you will actually be looping there. Um, and we'll actually be testing the DOM to see we're actually getting the effects that we want. But we need to first look at this introduction before we jump straight into RTO. Make sure. Hello. Uh, sorry, Jonathan. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if this is... Oh, okay. No, so let me let me okay so thank you everyone for for joining us and we're going to be seeing you all next week and as mentioned a big shout out to code capsules who's sponsoring these mentoring sessions making it free to public um highly suggest going and checking out uh their different deployment options and and just sort of sitting there with a big grin on your face when you see your page load so incredibly fast right thanks all cheers thanks Martin.